talking about pound and, and the cantos last week, I was talking about translation a lot. Uh, in the case of Eliot, uh, I'll be talking about quotation, a related but different <laughs> practice, uh, and one that uh, we'll see again uh, in Marianne Moore. Uh, in Pound's case, there is uh, a wish in poetry for immediacy, for some kind of seemingly natural language. Pound doesn't want and doesn't use quotation marks, just as he doesn't use footnotes. If, if, you, um, if you look at Pound in any of the editions uh, of his work from the, the cantos uh, 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 backward, you will find um, that the <laughs> Hi. Uh, uh, you will find that the uh, uh, the poems are presented without notes, without any kind of apparatus, without any kind of help. Uh, that's because, I think, um, Pound wants to, in some sense, give you a kind he doesn't want to get in your way in any uh, sense. He wants you to have a kind of immediate experience of the writing that he's uh, uh, presenting, uh, even uh, uh, when it comes in the form of quotation. Uh, but as I suggested, uh, for, for Pound, the sort of central practice uh, is one of uh, translation, which he uh, also describes as transmitting the, the impulse. Uh, I, and I, I, I spoke uh, last time as if the impulse meant uh, the motive or the emotion uh, in uh, a piece of writing. I think that Pound also had a kind of uh, scientific or technical <coughs> sense of that, that process of transmitting the impulse, uh, and that what he wants to do is uh, carry, uh, he, wa he wants writing to carry energy. Uh, he wants it to carry a kind of pulse, uh, and he wants to give you a kind of direct access to this. Uh, the uh, contrast with Eliot is. Uh, Striking, I think. Uh, instead of uh, translation, you find in Eliot uh, more often quotation. Uh, quotation, um, uh, which implies a certain relation to the literary past, just as Pound's practices of translation imply a relation to tradition. Think about the, the difference between these, these forms, translation and quotation. It's a way to understand the differences between <coughs> Eliot and Pound, uh, and through them uh, to think about modern po at least two of modern poetry's possible relations to the literature of the past. <coughs> uh, remember, too, that modern poetry, uh, and that's, that's a word or a phrase that Eliot and Pound both used, that modern poetry is a specifically historical category. Uh, it's, you know, it's a historical way of naming what it is. Uh, you could contrast this with uh, uh, romantic poetry, say, um, or imagism, um, yeah, which are names or labels that identify um, a, oh, um, uh, something more like um, uh, an aesthetic project or a uh, uh, a, um, uh, uh, a tendency. Uh, here, uh, to call uh, modern poetry modern is to choose as its defining quality uh, its position in history, uh, its uh, place uh, in literary history. And it does place modern poetry in history ambiguously. Is modern poetry, is, it, is its modernness uh, an index of um, the way it extends the past, or um, is it rather modern because it breaks with the past? Does modern mean some kind of renewal uh, and continuity, uh, or, or does, it, uh, uh, does it mean a rupture? 
Uh, translation and quotation suggest, uh, well, as I say, different uh, relations to the past. Pound aims to make it new. Uh, itself, I suggested a, a translated phrase from the, the ancient Chinese. Pound, in doing this, aims to carry culture forward, uh, to uh, you know, hand it over to us as a kind of uh, living and immediate thing. Uh, the past is, is renewable uh, in translation. It is uh, communicable. That, that's part of the premise of, of translation. Um, for Pound, the past is something that can be re-embodied uh, continually and needs to be re-embodied continually over and over again in new forms. In this sense, uh, translation envisions a past that is metamorphic. Uh, and, and mobile uh, and durable. Uh, it, you know, it's something that is always essentially itself. Uh, it's something that you know, is capable of being carried forward. Uh, and, and you can you'd think about Pound's um, voyagers, his seafarers, Odysseus or the seafarer poet, uh, a, as being, um, well, agents or, or uh, uh, representatives of acts of translation. They, they, they embody um, uh, the action of carrying something across, journeying. Uh, in quotation, however, uh, the past is something to be preserved, which is different. Uh, preserved uh, or maybe mocked, uh, in the sense of mocked, in the sense of copied or parodied. Quotation seems to imply two possible relations to the past when you think about it. Deference to the past, deference to what has been said, or some kind of violation of it. <coughs> uh, when you quote someone, uh, especially maybe your parents uh, or a teacher, uh, well, what are you doing? Uh, probably uh, you mean uh, either to honor them uh, or to mock them, right? Uh, to, uh, 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 in a sense, defer to their authority or to take it away, to empty it out. Both of these are, are possible. Uh, uh, empty it out by parroting it, uh, treating it as if it were merely iterable and formulaic uh, and therefore uh, without substance. Uh, Eliot's quotations uh, teeter uh, ambiguously uh, between these two options, and sometimes you may feel he's doing the one thing, and sometimes you may feel he's doing the other, that he's somehow deferring to the past and honoring it, or he's doing something quite subversive, uh, something parodic. <coughs> uh, and, and in Pound, I don't think there's any of that ambiguity ever. Uh, it, it's a very striking uh, contrast. If you listen to uh, Pound online, uh, you, you hear a voice uh, that is uh, fierce uh, and melodramatic uh, and um, uh, in earnest. Uh, you listen to Eliot, you, you hear another voice uh, entirely, uh, one dry, diffident, hard to place tonally. Uh, this is all worked into the poetry uh, and our encounters with it on the page. Um, again, you might contrast the heroic figures that you meet in Pound, uh, whether they're Odysseus or um, uh <coughs> a troubadour poet um, or um, one of the political leaders that Pound uh, fastens on. These are men of will uh, and willpower and action. These are the people that attract Pound's admiration and imagination. Who do you meet in Eliot? J. Alfred Prufrock. Uh, this figure of uh, extraordinary indecisiveness uh, and uh, um, uh, indeterminate will. Uh, someone who's diffident. Um, well, Prufrock is surely a version of 
Eliot, uh, and, and uh, we encounter in Eliot uh, generally some of the problems that Prufrock uh, raises for us um, through his um, uh, meandering uh, mode of speech uh, and difficult to place tone. Let's, um, let's look at some pictures of Eliot. Uh, maybe my favorite one, uh, <coughs> especially since we're going to be thinking about and talking about uh, Eliot's age uh, and how he, how he projects himself. This is, uh, this is uh, Tom at eight. Uh, he, he was born in St. Louis, the only major British poet born in St. Louis. Uh, in 1888, uh, he, he went to Harvard. Um, uh, this was a, uh, uh, not a surprise, uh, and, and a, uh, uh, in a sense, a family mission. Um, uh, he spent his summers, uh, importantly, in Massachusetts uh, and on the uh, coast of Massachusetts, the uh, North Shore of Boston, and uh, these places return and recur in his poetry. Uh, as a uh, graduate student, at Harvard uh, in 1910, he expatriated <laughs> to uh, Europe. Let's, this is uh, Eliot in 1910, 1911. He's, he had studied um, philosophy at Harvard, um, and he went on to study philosophy at Cambridge with Bertrand Russell. Uh, he wrote his master's thesis on F. H. Bradley. Uh, that's an association I'll say more about when we get to the wasteland. Uh, in uh, 1915, he met and married Vivian Haywood, uh, a uh, uh, charismatic and volatile Englishwoman. Uh, this romance produced for Eliot a kind of dramatic conflict with his family over his wish to marry her, uh, his uh, wish to take up residence in, in England, and uh, behind all of this and with all of this, his sense of vocation, his desire to become, to establish himself as a poet and man of letters rather than the more easily to be approved um, career of a professor and scholar uh, that he had seemed to have been made for. Uh, Pound was uh, Eliot's uh, older friend and mentor uh, very quickly uh, upon their uh, meeting in Europe. And Pound, uh, always putting his fingers in everything, uh, wrote uh, quite an extraordinary letter to Eliot's father. Uh, and I've got that on the, uh, your handout in the top page, a little quotation from it. Uh, it says, says a lot about Pound. It says something about Eliot, too. Uh, this is a, a letter in which um, uh, Pound felt the need to, probably with some encouragement, but probably also some embarrassment uh, from Eliot, <coughs> felt the need to um, defend Eliot's uh, expatriation. Uh, to the family patriarch. And uh, uh, Pound says, as to his, Eliot's coming to London, well, anything else is a waste of time and energy. No one in London cares a hang what is written in America. Uh, after getting an American audience, a man has to begin all over again if he plans for an international hearing. And who wouldn't plan for an international hearing? Uh, he, he even begins at a disadvantage. London likes discovering her own gods. Again, in a literary career, mediocrity is worse than useless. Either a man goes in to go the whole hog, uh, or he had better take to selling soap and gents' furnishings. You can, you, is this the right way to write, Mr. Eliot? I don't know. I, he, he must have felt so. Uh, <coughs> the situation has been very well summed up in the sentence. Henry James stayed in Paris and read Turgenev and Flaubert. Mr. Howells returned to America and read Henry James. <laughs> and then, and then uh, he, he says in, the, in another uh, important sentence, 
A literary man's income depends very much on how rigidly he insists on doing exactly what he himself wants to do. It's interesting. Uh, the idea is that by establishing some kind of uh, independence from uh, tastes in a literary market, Eliot will in fact come to establish his position in that literary market and his ability in fact, to create taste. Uh, and, and so, in fact, he did. Uh, at this early point in Eliot's career, there is uh, a kind of um, important conflict between conformity and revolt. Uh, conformity uh, to uh, his parents' wishes, social expectations, or revolt from them. Uh, which is also, I think, another way to describe the tension between two different senses or aspects of quotation. Uh, Pound wants Eliot's father to see that his son's revolt is okay uh, because, in fact, he's also going to conform. He's going to conform to a certain ideal of tradition, to professional standards. Uh, he's going to, um, uh, he's not just going to have a wild time, uh, he's going to work hard. Uh, and, and do what a literary man uh, should do. <coughs> uh, Eliot, uh, you'll see, uh, takes up these themes in different terms but uh, related ways in tradition and the individual talent, which I'll talk about later. Uh, like Pound, uh, Eliot, we'll see, wants to ally himself with tradition, uh, wants to ally himself with tradition over against ver libre, uh, Amy Lowell and Amygism, uh, and uh, at the same time, um, his relation to tradition, even from very early on, was potentially subversive, uh, and his poetry was very new and disturbing. Now, there are all sorts of interesting things in Beinecke, uh, including, here, here he is again, the author of Proofrock. Uh, including T.S. Eliot's waistcoat, <laughs> you know, H.D.'s death mask I showed you last time. Here, here's uh, uh, Eliot's waistcoat. Um, I like this uh, as an object, uh, as, as part of um, uh, the literary archive we have. Uh, also, uh, well, it's interesting, isn't it? It's a, uh, it's a piece of Eliot's costume. Uh, costume is very important for T.S. Eliot. I, I think it's also uh, potentially a kind of emblem of quotation in his work. Uh, is Eliot taking on the past and the aura of propriety in order to parody it or empower himself? Uh, these are, these are uh, questions we might ask even about the waistcoat. Uh, is, it, uh, is it some kind of disguise? Is it, uh, uh, is it um, uh, a um, costume through which he um, uh, conforms to social forms and expectations? Uh, or is it, again, something he puts on? Uh, all of these questions are at, uh, for me, the center of Eliot's <coughs> interest and, and, and power. Uh, and, and also, I think, uh, some of the uh, lasting power that he uh, exerts um, uh, in schools uh, and for students. I, I, will, um, I will confess that my high school yearbook carries a quotation from T.S. Eliot, in fact, from the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which I won't uh, identify for you. Uh, and, and as I think about that, why I cared about Eliot uh, when I was uh, 17 or, or so, um, not that I don't now, too, uh, uh, when I think about that, it, it seems to me that um, his special uh, combination of uh, ambition and aggression uh, expressed as it is very often by young people, uh, through parody or, or satire or diffidence, was you know, powerful for me, too, as a young person. 
Uh, all of this is, is um, on display in, in uh, Eliot's great poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is what I'll concentrate uh, on today. Um, <coughs> um, Prufrock is uh, a poem composed uh, initially at Harvard and carried with uh, – something Eliot carried along with him uh, in the years uh, after. Uh, a poem created out of pages and pages of drafts, which Eliot kept adding to uh, and going back over and, and, and recombining and recomposing them, somewhat like his repetitive and wayward speaker. Uh, you, you, you can find um, uh, early versions of the poem uh, in um, uh, a book of um, uh, Eliot's um, uh, early uh, and otherwise uncollected work that Christopher Ricks edited a few years ago called The Inventions of the March Hare. It's a very interesting book. Uh, and you can see Eliot uh, exploring different ways to write this poem. Uh, which hung around for a long time. Uh, it was eventually published uh, in 1915 in Poetry Magazine. Uh, and in this way, just like mowing, uh, just like uh, Yeats's The Fisherman, uh, which also appeared there then. Uh, also, uh, a poem we'll get to uh, in a couple weeks, Marianne Moore's A Grave, uh, and, and some of the Imagist poems we discussed last week. All these uh, appearing thanks to Pound. Uh, in Poetry Magazine. Uh, the poem became the title of Eliot's first volume. Uh, interesting, this is the, the cover of, of the book. Um, uh, it leaves off or the um, uh, it leaves off the full title, which was Proofrock and Other Observations, uh, which is an interesting title. Uh, First of all, is Prufrock an observation? Uh, that's uh, Eliot was treating this character as if he were an observation. You could think about what that might imply. Uh, and then think about that word, observations. Uh, it suggests something seen, of course, as well as some kind of uh, speculation. Um, uh, it's also um, uh, a way of defining and presenting Eliot's poems. He doesn't say Prufrock in other poems. He says Prufrock in other observations. Uh, and, and observations is, in fact, a, then a, t uh, a word that, that Marianne Moore would use to title her first book of poems a few years later. Uh, on that cover, uh, we see Eliot's name <laughs> and Prufrock's uh, in some kind of uh, alteration uh, – alternation, rather uh, – Prufrock being a little bit bigger than T.S. Eliot. Uh, but um, raising for us graphically <laughs> the simple question, what is the relationship between these two? Uh, uh, are they, uh, yeah, uh, the one man created the other thing, uh, Prufrock. Uh, are they the same thing? How different are they? Uh, here's uh, uh, the uh, uh, interior of the book, uh, you can see, although, well, you can't see, but if you get a better look at this online, you will see uh, that this book, which is in Beinecke, uh, has a signature on it, W. Stevens, uh, N.Y., uh, October 17, 1917. So this was, this was Stevens' copy, uh, at which he, as he was a young man wandering around the streets of New York, uh, picked up. Uh, and, and kept. <coughs> um, <coughs> it was uh, like uh, Frost's early uh, work published in London in 1917 now uh, in, in Bloomsbury by the Egoist Press. Uh, and there's the table of contents. Um, the uh, first and long poem uh, included in the volume being the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Well, what do we expect from a poem that calls itself that, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock? 
Uh, first of all, what do we expect from this genre, the love song, a love song? What is a love song? What is a love song like? Presumably, it would be a romantic poem, uh, even a poem about romance. Uh, uh, what we get is perhaps something more like a parody of a romantic poem uh, and something much stranger. Uh, this is going to be familiar to very many of you. Let us go then, you and I. When the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table, let us go through certain half deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. Meter? Uh, it's a topic we've, we've raised before. Uh, it isn't uh, iambic pentameter. Um, the, uh, it's notably, importantly, not iambic pentameter. Uh, instead, uh, you are introduced to another kind of rhythm of speech, uh, which you can work at to scan, uh, but without even uh, going into any detail about it, I think we can describe that rhythm as languid, uh, as open to variation, uh, as um, including hesitancy and sometimes abruptness. Uh, it is uh, a way of speaking that is interrupted often, uh, is uh, alternately um, uh, voluble uh, and nervous. <coughs> uh, the, um, uh, uh, the poem's initial discontinuities of rhythm uh, and pattern uh, and image introduce <coughs> us to um, it really a new kind of structure in poetry that would include, um, well, a kind of um, um, almost, a, almost a principle that any time you establish a pattern, you must quickly break it. Uh, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky. Sounds like this character is going to speak in couplets, like a patient etherized upon a table. Where did that come from? Uh, <laughs> uh, let us, you know, we, we could supply another third line uh, 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 that would be uh, very different, I think. Um, immediately, we are invited to, um, well, uh, surrealistically conjure um, a uh, prone uh, patient, uh, uh, someone, um, someone sick uh, and being attended to and etherized, unconscious, uh, uh, and objectified uh, uh, upon a table. Uh, if if uh, we felt as though we were going to be in um, a romantic, crepuscular atmosphere, uh, we are suddenly uh, confronted with an image quite disturbing uh, and ugly. And note that it doesn't rhyme. Uh, there <laughs> I suppose you could, you could connect table to hotels and shells below, um, <coughs> but uh, it's not a uh, strong connection, and um, there has been uh, no um, uh, preparation for it before. Uh, so immediately, we are given an image uh, and uh, a rhyme decision, if you like, uh, that complicates any kind of sense of uh, pattern that we might have predicted from the first two lines. That rhythm, um, well, <coughs> um, 
the contrast to uh, an iambic poem uh, is, is strong and should be emphasized. And I, I want to uh, draw your attention to um, uh, an example that would have been in the ears of Eliot's uh, listeners, uh, and that is uh, the <laughs> Eliot's listeners, Eliot's readers. That is um, uh, the end of uh, Tennyson's Ulysses, um, a poem well known in the 19th century. The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. I, I quote it too because uh, Eliot loved this passage and it returns in his late poetry uh, in uh, uh, interesting echoes. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, we're older, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Where, uh, echoing, I think, uh, uh, Milton's Satan, uh, the, uh, the blank verse suddenly you know, becomes a kind of uh, heroic medium of the will. Uh, well, the contrast is important uh, with the poetry that Eliot is presenting to us uh, because here uh, the question of the speaker's will is so much at issue and his manner of speech is so different from the example that Tennyson gives us. Uh, Tennyson, specifically in this dramatic monologue, as in others uh, of uh, his uh, oeuvre or other important 19th century examples, introduces us to a dramatic speaker who has a kind of coherent character uh, and, and uh, um, uh, who, whose unity of character, if you like, uh, is allied to the unity of the verse form itself. Eliot gives us something very different. Uh, he creates in Prufrock, I would say, not a character. He, rather, he creates something more like a consciousness. Uh, he creates uh, uh, a fragmentary consciousness uh, that rises and falls, uh, takes shape and disperses before us. John Stuart Mill said uh, in, in a memorable uh, uh, passage that poetry, lyric poetry is what he was thinking of, is overheard speech. Overheard speech. Well, and you can think uh, if you have some sense of uh, the Romantic poetry of Wordsworth uh, or, or um, uh, Coleridge uh, as examples before you of, of what Mill had in mind, the way in which in those poems we listen in on um, uh, a soliloquizing uh, poet's thoughts. Listening to Prufrock is much less like listening to someone speak on the street or, or on the stage, uh, then it is like closing your eyes and remembering uh, or inventing voices <coughs> in your mind. Eliot is creating a kind of overheard inner speech. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's letting us listen in on uh, a mind uh, that we don't see whole, we don't feel whole, uh, we only get parts of it. Uh, fluctuation. Uh, this, is the, this is the medium and the, the rhythm uh, that uh, we, we enter when we enter the poem. Uh, there is, uh, as I was already suggesting, no overarching pattern for the poem's verse form. Um, I think this is probably true for uh, other uh, dimensions of organization uh, as well. Um, 
there are rather, uh, in this poem, what I would call uh, a kind of set of unfolding local systems of organization. Um, there are uh, couplets. We see couplets in that first paragraph, but then they're not systematically pursued. Um, instead, what you get uh, in the poem are a lot of loose ends, uh, pauses, uh, bits and pieces of language. Uh, language that is almost always full of quotations, which your editor will give you uh, the source for some of them. Uh, what we have then in the poem as you move through it is a, is a lot of shifting, improvised orders. Uh, this formal instability in the poem uh, is related to and it constructs uh, a special sort of speaker. Uh, one who is uh, performing for us uh, his, his thoughts. Uh, his thoughts uh, experienced as a set of routines or riffs or acts. Uh, and they come and go without uh, very definite uh, aim or conclusion. <coughs> Looking at the cover of, of Prufrock, I asked you to think about the relationship between Prufrock and T.S. Eliot. Uh, you, think you, you can think about uh, Prufrock, <coughs> the name itself, J. Alfred Prufrock, almost a kind of parody of T.S. Eliot. Um, the, the name suggests a kind of upper class uh, English or Anglophile person. Uh, those formal initials are, are uh, uh, pretentious in a way. Um, I think it's, it's proper to think of Prufrock as, in some sense, a kind of comic figure, uh, almost like a cartoon or, or a caricature or device. Um, on one level, uh, he is a kind of parody of a romantic singer. Uh, he is bourgeois. He is intellectualizing. Uh, he's incapable of grasping and expressing what we expect from a love song. That is strong emotion. Uh, the poem uh, can be seen, too, as a, as a kind of critique of romantic egotism and uh, of the words worthy and ideal of, of expression. This is uh, something that uh, Eliot uh, theorizes polemically uh, in his essay, uh, Tradition and the Individual Talent. Uh, and in fact, why don't we look there for a few minutes to uh, get more sense of uh, Eliot's ideas. On 946, at the back of your book there, uh, he says, um, quoting Wordsworth in the preface to Lyrical Ballads, we must believe that emotion recollected in tranquility is an, exact, is an inexact formula. For it is neither emotion nor recollection nor without distortion of meaning tranquility that you get in an Eliot poem at least. <laughs> it is a concentration and a new thing resulting from the concentration of a very great number of experiences, which to the practical and active person would not seem to be experiences at all. It is the concentration which does not happen consciously or of deliberation. Uh, these experiences are not recollected, and they finally unite in an atmosphere which is tranquil only in that it is a passive attending upon the event. There's a, uh, Eliot is trying to describe poetry here as having a kind of, uh, generating a kind of experience in and of itself that is distinct from any kind of recollected experience. Uh, and it is curiously impersonal, as he imagines it, and he continues, there's a great deal in the writing of poetry which must be conscious and deliberate. In fact, the bad poet is usually unconscious where he ought to be conscious, and conscious where he ought to be unconscious. We know what he means. Uh, both errors tend to make him 
personal. And, and now, T.S. Eliot will say, poetry is not a turning loose of emotion, but an escape from emotion. It is not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. But, of course, only those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from these things, uh, which is an uh, extraordinary kind of coda to this uh, polemical passage. Uh, and, and revealing, of course, uh, the, the way in which Eliot, even as he's polemicizing against a romantic poetry that would be too personal, uh, is deeply invested in uh, the personal uh, and personality uh, and conflicted about it. Uh, <coughs> I've been uh, talking about ambiguity uh, in Eliot. Um, uh, well, we can speak of ambivalence. Uh, this essay uh, retains, even while it is critiquing, a certain romantic story of, of creation. Uh, and we could say something similar about Eliot's love song. Prufrock uh, is a kind of pretext or a device through which Eliot can speak of himself. Uh, Prufrock becomes a way of writing about the self when, to Eliot, it no longer seems plausible <coughs> to write as oneself, as uh, uh, Wordsworth had felt it to be. You can think of Prufrock as a, as a kind of mask behind which you hear a young poet asking questions about himself and his art. Uh, list the poem's questions. There, Prufrock asks questions throughout. Uh, do you recall them? They are, do I dare? Do I dare disturb the universe? So how should I presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, he, he says that pretty often, shall I say this, shall I say that? Daring, presuming, beginning, what shall I say? These are, are they not, an ambitious young poet's questions about how to write poetry. The question is, why should beginning be something that you really have to dare? Uh, what does that imply? Uh, why should it be frightening? Why should it give you pause? Uh, and why, if these are a young man's questions, as I'm <coughs> suggesting, does Prufrock seem as old, as old and weary as he does? In fact, how old do you think he is? I don't know. Uh, uh, ask yourselves that question. Uh, ask yourselves what, what evidence you would have for one answer or another. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint his age. Prufrock is, isn't he, a kind of old young man? <coughs> or young old man? Uh, he is cautious and aggressive at the same time. Uh, old and young. These paradoxes, I think, point to Eliot's sense of his place, his own place, in literary history, in some sense of what it meant to be modern for Eliot. Uh, Prufrock is burdened by the question of how to begin. Indeed, he begins exactly by deferring beginning, uh, by failing to come to the point, by putting it off, by delaying. Because, by implication, beginning is indeed something threatening, something that must be dared. But this only makes sense if Prufrock really does want to disturb the universe, or at least the system of culture as he found it. It only makes sense if beginning really does require disturbing things. Uh, the implication is that the universe is already complete without Prufrock, without T.S. Eliot and anything that he might do or say. You can extend this to Eliot's idea of culture, uh, and in particular to his sense of the literary past. 
uh, you see the idea in tradition and the individual talent. Uh, a 942-943, he speaks of, uh, towards the bottom of the page on 942, uh, tradition as a kind of ideal order of monuments. Tradition is in some sense, well, it's monumental and it's already complete, as he imagines it. To add to it, to enter it, would be to change it, to disturb it. Uh, in fact, Eliot evolves here a quite ingenious and complicated argument for how the new could indeed be introduced to a tradition conceived in the terms I just described. Eliot says uh, on the bottom of the page about uh, the, uh, any, any new poet, <coughs> The necessity that he shall conform, and there's that word, conform. Think of the waistcoat. The necessity that he shall conform, that he shall cohere and remain put together, is not one-sided. This is quite an extraordinary argument. He's saying, it's not only necessary for a new poet to, in a sense, conform to tradition. What happens when a new work of art is created is something that happens simultaneously to all the works of art which preceded it. Something which happens simultaneously to all the works of art which preceded it. This is quite a claim. The existing monuments form an ideal order among themselves which is modified by the introduction of the new, the really new work of art among them. The existing order is complete before the new work arrives. For order to persi persist after the supervention of novelty, Novelty comes as something that supervenes. It has force. It's a leopard in the temple. The whole existing order must be, if ever so slightly, altered. And so the relations, proportions, values of each work of art toward the whole are readjusted. And this is conformity between the old and the new. It's uh, uh, here, Eliot is struggling with, with an idea of tradition as something that is uh, static and, and fully uh, uh, present in and of itself, uh, a sense of the new as something that is revolutionary uh, and that threatens tradition or is threatened by it. How can he bring them into alignment? Well, through this very complicated process uh, that he describes, which uh, gives the modern, gives the new, um, an extraordinary power to make us see and, in fact, to realign the relations among all the works of the past. This is, uh, uh, as I say, quite an extraordinary power. Uh, the implication is the new poet must, in some sense, wrest authority from all those who have come before through a kind of imaginative and rhetorical violence a kind of uh, insurrection in, in the temple of culture. Prufrock's sense of age uh, expresses for him a feeling of belatedness, an anxiety that he's already uh, run out of time. His very youth, the fact that he's only just now starting, makes him old. Uh, to presume would be to reverse this order, to dare to come before and to claim priority uh, for his own work. Uh, as I say these sentences, I sound a whole lot like Harold Bloom uh, as uh, uh, he uh, describes uh, the uh, uh, mission of any uh, poet uh, in his work on the anxiety of influence. Uh, and that is because uh, Bloom's work is uh, deeply indebted precisely to Eliot uh, and to tradition and the individual talent. These are questions uh, I'll say a little bit more about um, uh, next time uh, as we um, uh, finish discussing Eliot's uh, uh, love song and uh, begin to uh, talk about the wasteland. <laughs>